In today's presentation, mm. I first explain why I have chosen a hagiography dealing with Ramchandra Suri. Next, I highlight the five main controversies which turned Ramchandra Suri into one of the most influential Jain Acharyas of the 20th century. And at the end of this presentation, I suggest considering these controversies in terms of their importance for cont contemporary Shvetambara's self-assertion as a religious minority. This paper on Ran Chandra Sui's hagiography takes up a recent trend of examining the lives of 20th century Jain saints. And it's, um, I think, well presented today. At the same time, my paper stands a little apart as it seeks to investigate a particular English Jain hagiography of the 20th century, which has fallen into my hands a month ago only, and deals with a Jain Acharya of the Tapagacha Samudai I'm particularly familiar with. And in order to give you a more detailed idea of this, um, I would like to... During my long-term research from 2001 and to, uh, to 2003 in Palitana, my interactions with Jain ascetics focused on Ram Chandra Suri Samudai. In 2002, um, Chatumas, in, um, in, sorry, in 2002 Chatumas, not less than 14 Acharyas of Ram Chandra Suri Samudai had assembled and guided a huge rainy season assembly of about 200 sadhus, 500 sadhvis, about, and about uh, 3,500 lay people. In this intense period of my research, I established close contacts with the samudai that continue until today. Thus, during the last 10 years, my reflections on Shvetambara community have been tremendously influenced by these contacts. I also benefit from my connections to Ram Chandra Suri Samudai with respect to my present research project, which is on child initiation, Baal Diksha. In the course of this work, I also have come across hagiographies of Ram Chandra Suri, you will soon understand why, including this exclusively English volume published in 2013. The author of this hagiography, Sadvi Jean Pragnya Shriji, is in her 40s and never met Ram Chandra Suri personally. She obtained the order to arrange the volume through her guru Kirtiyash Suri, who is on this picture here with his guru. And Kirtiyash Suri obviously pre-selected many of the hagiogra hagiography subjects due to his intimate knowledge of Ram Chandra Suri's life. As Kirtiyash Suri himself puts it in the introduction, uh, quote, lived in his august presence since he was a boy of eight, I, he was a boy, boy of eight, took diksha under him when he was 14, end of quote, and also served the ailing senior acharya during the last 10 years of his life. Thus, Kirti Asuri can be seen as one of the ascetics who once belonged to the inner circle of his guru, and his point of view is traceable throughout the volume. The openly proclaimed purpose of this volume is, according to its author, to provide a source on Ram Chandra Suri's life, life for English-speaking upper-middle-class Jains, in particular uh, for the youth with English language education, if not with the center of life in UK or US. The volume also aims to reach an audience beyond the Jain community, as reflected by the fact that basic terms are carefully explained and even listened, uh, listed in a glossary at the end of the volume. Very simple terms a Jain would know uh, at once. Another, another less overtly proclaimed but still visible motivation for writing the hagiography stems from Kirtia Suri's endeavor to strengthen his claim for leadership of Ram Chandra Suri Samudai, as he is one of the most, most promising candidates for being selected as Gachadipati in the future. In the hagiography by Jean Pragna Shridri, Ram Chandra Suri's life is presented to the reader in the form of an auspicious number of 108 anecdotes. Remarkably, almost all of them point to the conflictual situation of a saint who, according to Kirti Yasui, was, quote, 
either abused or applauded, end of quote. Thus, this hagiography appears particularly important as it offers a wide range of controversial subjects. At the same time, this is particularly surprising as controversies are usually not made public. Though controversial issues have been and still are almost daily issues among my Jane's, Jane friends, at least in Palitana, Ahmedabad, and Mumbai, they are discussed behind closed doors only and with a certain feeling of uneasiness. Conflicts threaten to disrupt the unity of the community as they obviously contradict two basic values, nonviolence, ahinsa, and the acceptance of manifold viewpoints known as anekandivada. However, one cannot deny that the intellectual disputes in which Ram Chandra Sui was involved often led and still lead to public conflicts within local and pan-Indian Shwetambara communities and also outside Shwetambara community and also with the wider um, society. As the English hagiography of Ram Chandra Suri's um, openly addresses several controversial issues, I dare to bring these conflicts back on stage. If we systematically turn to these controversies, we cannot deny that they have significantly shaped the Shvetambara community of the 20th and the beginning 21st century. In the following, I will attempt to give an overview of the most important controversies by pointing out to five general issues underlying these conflicts. First, defending Baldiksha or the initiation of children into an ascetic fold. Second, proclaiming a strict interpretation of Ahinsa. Third, the proper use of the Dev Dravya donations. Fourth, the Ek and Titi dispute. And fifth, the dispute on Guru Puja. These issues are not really new for scholars of Jainism but it is new that they are so crucial for a hagiography in order to characterize Ram Chandra Sui as a pugnacious and persistent personality. <clears throat> it is of course very helpful for my present research project on Baal Diksha that this issue was the first to be raised during Ram Chandra Sui's early life before he took Diksha when he was known as the boy Tribuban alias Sabudo. Tribuwan was born in spring 1896 into a successful joint family of Jain Visa Srimali merchants in the village Parda close to Kambat. Though strictly speaking, Ramchandra Suri was not a child anymore when he took Diksha at the age of 17. His hagiography draws a vivid, vivid picture of a spiritually premature boy who experienced very early in life the, quote, call of the soul, which is also the title of the book. After his, parents, uh, <clears throat> sorry, after his parents died during the plague epidemic of the late 19th century, Tribuban had a strong experience of world detachment and had expressed the urge to live as a Jain sadhu since he was seven years of age. Several encounters with Jain sadhus in the local Upashraya point to a serious boy who carefully examined the truthfulness of the monks and refused to respect them if he found their discipline too lax. Religious activities were further promoted by his great-grandmother, who taught him the daily rituals, sent him to the local pachala, and motivated him to take up fasts regularly at the age of seven. However, she was not ready to give her permission when he finally asked her consent to take diksha at the age of nine. Consequently, the ritual was stopped by his paternal uncle, who tried to divert him from religious matters by placing him in the service of an advocate for the next eight years. Tribuvan met his future guru Prem Vijay, later known as Prem Sui, when he was 14 years of age, and when under his guidance the desire to take Diksha flared up again, Tribuvan was even banned from visiting lo the, the local Upashraya. Only three years later, in 1913, he successfully outwitted his guardian and, after an awkward escape, received Diksha by Dan Suri with the name of Ram Vijay. The focus of Tribhuvan's childhood and youth can clearly be seen as a prelude to Ram Chandra Suri's lifelong concern for Baal Diksha. 
none of the other controversial issues is taken up as frequently. As my presentation today must also pay attention to several other and equally important issues, I cannot discuss Ram Chandra Suri's dedication to Baal Diksha in detail at this point. However, the main argument can be paraphrased as follows, again in the words of his Shishya Kirtyar Suri. Quote, due to the spiritual education received at a very early age, a Baal Mumukshu has no difficulties to choose the road less traveled road, uh, the road less traveled. Whereas for a layman, separating a child from his mother appears inhuman, the spiritual seeker understands both the souls are taken away from bondage and dependence, and only without bondage there is a road to spiritual bliss." End of quote. The positive attitude toward, towards the issue of Baal Diksha has promoted, as promoted by Ran Chandra Suri Samudai until today, rests on two equally important claims. On the one hand, it refers to the religious freedom of the individual, but also of the religious minority in general. On the other hand, it deals with the survival of the ascetic Tritambara orders, in particular with regard to the central importance of child initiation for the upbringing of future Acharyas. And I want to add that all of the Acharyas um, whom were who were presented today had a Baal Diksha. Uh, when the public controversy about Baal Diksha eventually led to several court cases in Baroda from 1929 to 1930, and finally ended with a ban on child initiation, in this princely state, Ram Vijay took the side of Saga Anand Suri and of Labdi Suri and of Acharya Tulsi, and against the reformist Acharya Vala Vijay, who was supported by the Jain Juvak Sang. Despite the public disapproval of Baal Diksha in colonial India, um, and also later after independence, the mature Ram Chandra Suri initiated many children himself throughout the decades. Okay, the next topic, which at first glance might not have an equally high potential for conflict, became very controversial after publicly being, publicly being addressed by young Muniram Vijay, and that is the issue of pro proclaiming a strict interpretation of Ahinsa. Immediately after his diksha, young Ram Vijay retreated for about four years from the world and devoted himself exclusively to the extensive textual study of the Shastras. When at the end of this period, one of the more senior ascetics fell ill before a sermon, the only 20-year-old monk had to take on this task, and his oratory talent was discovered straight away. His sermon soon attracted larger crowds of people and even from outside the Jain community. A certain public fame was bestowed on the 24-year-old Ram Suri during his first rainy season in Ahmedabad in 1920, when he delivered public sermons at central places of the city. Initially, he focused on quite a simple subject, namely in denouncing the popular habit of lay people of regularly eating in restaurants, which ignored the, strictly, the strict dietary rules as proclaimed in the Jain Shastras. Apparently, his charismatic speech had such a lasting effect, even on non-Jains, that two of the most popular restaurants, Chandra Vilas and Lakshmi Vilas, recorded a significant decline in visitors and a serious loss of earnings. However, with regard to the next conflict, Ram Suri had to stand up to an even more prominent opponent. After Ram Vijay had straightforwardly de decried uh, the animal uh, sacrifice of, uh, in the Badakali temple, a public protest against this Hindu practice was formed with the effect that animal sacrifices were suspended by a responsible pundit who feared the violence of the mob. Against this type of propaganda, Gandhi argued in the weekly journal Navjivan that, quote, the goat has been rescued at the cost of indulging in, an op in oppression of the priest. How can one resort to tyranny to save a goat?" End of quote. Despite his opposition, Gandhi, who was 30 years his senior, was obviously impressed by the charisma and the public impact of the young Ram Vijay. Thus, he sent some of his Satyagraha companions in order to win him over to his own ranks, an attempt which remained unsuccessful. The moral argument between Ram Vijay and Gandhi was resumed once again when in 1926, the Calicut textile mill owner, Ambalal Sarabai, Jain Shravak, gave the order to shoot 
60 dogs at his factory premises in order to prevent the spread of rabies. While Ram Vijay condemned this act as a senseless cruelty, Gandhi countered in Navajivan that it was the duty of the factory owner to protect his employees against rabies. He probably did not expect that Ram Vijay would reply again by taking Gandhi's newspaper article as a hook for his next sermon. Ram Vijay explained to an audience of several thousand that an apostle for Ahimsa must not re reduce his concern to humans, but also has to consider less powerful animals and all life forms. Ram Vijay's goal was nothing less than to present a radically Jain definition of Ahimsa, which was clearly different from Gandhi's politically motivated concept of nonviolence. Needless to say that according to Ram Vijay, Gandhi's version of Ahimsa was gross, gross misinterpretation of the fundamental value of the Jain Shastras. Ram Vijay turned his harsh criticism also against Jain reformist educational projects, mainly with the initiative to stop the vivisection of frogs at Jain colleges and universities in 1929. According to Ram Vijay, the organizers and trustees of these educational projects had raised money for the institutions in the name of Jain Dharma, but allowed practices at these schools which were contrary to the basic doctrines. This accusations of misusing the community's property leads us also to the next issue. And this is about the Dravia donations. The first opponent, as mentioned earlier, in his own ranks was the reformist-minded Acharya Vallabhsuri, who was supported by the reformist organization Jain Juvak Sang. An important matter of discord was the usage, or rather the misuse, of the Dev Dravya donations to temples. These donations are considered as the spiritually most beneficial act of giving, or rather giving up for a layman. According to the strict interpretation as favored by Ram Vijay, donations of that category may exclusively be used for maintaining the temple building and the images, but not for paying the temple servants or for sponsoring charitable projects. However, at the beginning of the 1930s, it was a common practice of many Jain temple trusts to divert money from the Dev Dravya Fund or other purposes. <clears throat> Whereas many reformists sought to officially acknowledge this practice as acceptable, Ram Vijay held that this practice counteracted and devalued the traditional act of ritual gift giving and also the prescription given in the seven fields of giving. The situation got out of control when after a public debate in 1979 in Bombay, the respective followers of the opponents started to physically attack each other and also threaten the involved ascetics. A year later, Ram Vijay officially received the title of Vyakyan Vajraspati, a charismatic and powerful preacher, and was inaugurated as Panyas, a Jain teacher. This office entitled him to actively discuss both his favorite subjects, Baal Diksha and Dev Dravya, at the All India Shvetamba Mutipujak Shravan Samelan in March 1934 in Ahmedabad. After 34 days of convention, the decision was taken that in all respects, the injunctions of the Shastras must be followed and, with regard to both the crucial subjects for him, the dispute was settled in favor of Panyas Ram Vijay's understanding of these issues. In April 1936, two years after the Shraman, uh, Shravan Samalan, when Ram Vijay was 40 years, of, uh, 40 years old, Prem Suri ordained him an Acharya and his name was expanded to Ram Chandra Suri. His lay followers included a disproportionately high number of industrialists and politicians. For this conjuncture, Ram Chandra Suri was criticized many times. He, however, argued that there were many millionaires among his followers due to the fact that they were greater sinners than the poor and thus needed spiritual instruction more urgently. Consequently, Ram Chandra Suri inspired a high number of millionaires to take diksha, including spectacular cases of multimillionaires taking diksha in a cricket stadium. He also prompted a number of gener generous donations, especially with regard to the Dev Dravya Fund. This led to some of the most important Jain temple constructions in the 20th century and also renovation projects, which undoubtedly serve as a significant significant representation of a religious minority. However, the problem remained how to pay the temple servants. In 1987, 
91-year-old Ranchandra Suri took up the issue again while spending Chato Mas in Palitana. Uh, and for his initiative, he received sympathies across the Jain orders by encouraging the establishment of a special fund. Before the next rainy season in 1988, 10 million rupees were collected, which were paid into the Shrima Jinmanya General Fund. From, this, from the interest of this, um, of this uh, fund, um, the temple servants and other employees of the Ananji Kalanji Pedi are paid to the present day. Um, the fourth issue is uh, the before-mentioned issue regarding the Panchang, the Ig and BTD dispute. This is the perhaps most prominent example for an ongoing dispute within the ascetic orders of the Tapagacha, and um, this regards the disagreement with uh, uh, regarding sorry the ritual calendar Panchang, as the details of this. Uh, dispute have already been elaborated and commented by John Court in 1999. I will focus here on the most uh, important social implications of the dispute. The controversy began in 1935, uh, led to a severe fraction within Tapagacha, flared up again in the late 18, uh, 1980s, and continues until today. The first serious dispute about the Panchang regulation arose during Chatomas of the year 1935 with regard to the question when to celebrate Samvatsari Pratikaman. In the course of it, the Elis in terms of Baal Diksha, Saga Anand Sui and Ram Vijay, at this time still a Muni, became opponents. With regard to the respective regulations favored by them, Saga Anand Sui became the spokesman of the so-called Ek Titipaksh and Ram Vijay became known as the leader of Bet Titipaksh. As different interpretations resulted in celebrating the most important Jain festival on different days, emotions among the lay people were high and occasionally even escalated. Consequently, between 1942 and 1943, the Ananjikalanji Pedi arranged several meetings of the opponents in Palitana and urged them to negotiate a, a uniform ritual calendar in order to prevent the split of the gacha. When, after several months, of tough negotiations, no agreement could be reached. An impartial Sanskrit scholar, Hindu, Pandit Parshuman Vadya from Pune, was consulted as an arbitrator, and um, Pandit Vadya clearly agree agreed with Ram, Ch Ram Chandra uh, Sui, or da at, this, at this time Ram Vijay, but his judgment was not accepted by Saga Anand Sui with the effect that the Tapagacha was split into two faction fractions that remain that remain reconciled until today. The majority of Tapagacha adheres to the Ik Titipaksh, while the B Titipaksh is today exclusively presented by the Ram Chandra Suri Samudai. In its core, the interpretation of the ritual calendar is concerned with adhering to ritual observances, which clearly form another important general feature of a religious community similar to sacred buildings. This also holds for the last controversial issue to be mentioned today, and that is the dispute on Guru Puja. In the mid-1970s, only a few years before Ramchandra Ram Sui's 80th birthday, another dispute with regard to ritual observances arose, this time concerning the particular mode of worship of living and deceased Acharyas. According to the hagiography, this controversy was started by lay people who were already displeased by the ongoing Panchang dispute. Emotions were so high on the part of the laity that Ramchandra Suri, Suri's followers had to demand police protection for their guru in order to guard him against an assassination attempts. In the Ramchandra Suri Samudai, the guru pujan to all nine limbs, the Navang, um, of an acharya is carried out with vasak tape powder in the same way as sandalwood paste, chandan is applied to nine limbs of the image of a jina. Ek titi samudais reject this practice and consider it sacrilege. They maintain that only the portraits of a, jain, of a, sorry, of a jina can be worshipped in that mode, whereas they venerate their acharyas by touching only the right food, ik angni puja. With reference to several citations of Jain scriptures, Ramchandra Suri and his successors argued and continue to argue that the Nau Agni Puja 
had been recommended by ascetic authorities of earlier centuries. More so than by Ram Chandrasuri himself, this argument was fervently promoted by his disciples and successors, Mahodaya Suri, Hembushan Suri, Punyabal Suri, and Kiriya Suri. This form of worship finds uh, its clearest expression today in the memorials dedicated to Ram Chandra Suri, which were created after he deceased in 1991 at the age of 96. The most important one of these is surely the Smirti Mandi in Amnabad, which was consecrated in 2002 close to the site of Ram Chandra Suri's cremation um, site, sorry, um, on the bank of the river Sabarbati, and it contains a number of images of the Acharya in different life stages, as we can see here. His Antim Yatra, the last journey of his body to the cremation ground, was accompanied by several tens of thousands of, pe of people, not only Jains, and had full media coverage. This might provide a clue about the phenomenon that despite, or rather because of having the reputation of being relentless up to the point of obstinacy, Ram Chandra Suri was one of the most influential Jain leaders of the 20th century. I will now come to a short conclusion. The choice of controversies as the main subject of a Jain hagiography appears extraordinary only at first glance. In fact, according to the general perspective of ascetics, the insistence on a particular position and the concern for the preservation of doctrine and their correct interpretation goes back to the very old conviction that only the discourse on the Shastras can guarantee the preservation of the Jain Shasan and thus best serve the community. From the point of view of ascetics, these discourses only become problematic if they leave the ascetic community and are evaluated or devaluated by lay people. At the same time, Ram Chandra Suri gained importance because of his stamina with regard to the competition with other spiritual leaders. Thus, he is praised by his lay followers exactly because he never yielded on any of the disputes that he regarded as essential. With regard to the content of the disputes, we can hardly claim that the issues were chosen randomly. On the contrary, all of the five commonly known disputes are of lasting importance, not only for Ram Chandra Suri Samudai, but for the whole Shvetambara community. Moreover, I would like to suggest that on a more general level, we can also state that the disputes always include messages that aim to defend the Shvetambara Jain community as a religious minority within the wider multi-religious society of Western India. Thus, the issue of Baal Diksha correlates with the question of religious freedom. The strict definition of Ahinsa seeks to be separated from its rather mundane interpretation, and the issue of Dev Dravya clearly argues against an alienation of communal Jain assets for a more general purpose. Likewise, the Panchang dispute and the controversy with regard to the Guru Puja gain importance by the declared need to present a unity within a multi-religious environment. For this reason, it is no surprise that an ascetic Jain order, which is known for its radical stance, has produced the most extensive hagiography of its founder in English language, and thus to a larger readership. In that sense, his hagiography can also be read as a kind of manifesto for a future leader, in this case of Kirti Yasui, who provides us with a guideline how he is going to lead his community through the challenges of the 21st century. I would like to leave for the discussion a very simple knowledge question. To what extent do these aforementioned and other disputes emerge in hagiographies of other historical and contemporary acharyas? And how do they complement the image drawn by Gina Pragnashriji in her hagiography about Ramchandra Suri? Thank you very much. <laughs>